Welcome back to Reaching for My Roots. This episode, I'm going to look at one of my maternal branches that went from being fairly average and ordinary and plain to actually having some pretty exciting stuff that I learned over time as technology allowed me to learn more. But genealogy research always provides surprises for even the most open-minded historians. Quite often, we look back on certain ancestral branches and think to ourselves, how boring everyone seemed back then. Whether they appeared to all be agricultural labourers or weavers in the same village for centuries or something a little more exciting, there's always a nugget of information just to click on a journey website or a document in an old registry away from being exposed. Back when I started out in the 1990s, I was simply using the old archival systems of microfish and the LDS registers, which some were even on like little cards in a like an old Teledex sort of thing. Um, that was fun. Anyway, I discovered a maternal line that for all intents and purposes looked to be just your typical run-of-the-mill Scottish family. After all, what could simple birth, death and marriage records dating back 200 to 250 years really tell me other than the basic facts? And like many other amateur historians, I compiled this information into a family tree and moved on, thinking I'd done well to possess some knowledge of who my ancestors were and where they came from and what they appeared to do for a job. But curiosity got the better of me, as it often does. And when the internet became more and more of a source of genealogical records, I got to finding out more and more and more. I was also able to make connections with various distant cousins around the world who shared my curious nature and thirst for learning about our ancestors. Luckily for all of us, we also shared a tendency to be generous with our findings, which really was helpful to everyone. So, yeah, my maternal grandfather, Tom Little, was a really wonderful man but with many great characteristics but all I really knew when I embarked on my journey to discover his ancestral history was that his family was a blend of Scottish and English people. I know, right? That's basically everyone in the Western world, apparently, especially if ancestry, DNA, ethnicity estimates or anything to go by. Tom's paternal grandmother, Mary Wally, is where I sort of began to find some interesting stories peeling out from under the layers. Mary married David Little, the son of Master Baker Alexander Little, a Scot who, from some family folklore, is said to have supplied food to the Eureka stockaders in Ballarat back in the young days. What I do know is that he was gazetted a few times as having campaigned against godless drunks prowling the streets after dark and having spent a lot of time in Ballarat in recent years, his campaigns didn't go too well with this still a pretty shitty place. Sorry to anyone who lives there. Mary and David's son, David Leslie Little, known as Les to everybody, was married to Amelia Robinson, said to have been an amazing singer in her day. I can't really verify much because obviously recording wasn't really a thing back when she was around, but apparently she did perform in front of some audiences at some point in her life and was pretty good at it. Her father, Frederick, a Presbyterian minister from Lincolnshire, plied his trade across various mining towns in Victoria during the gold rush years before eventually setting up in Melbourne's northern suburbs where he lived to be 95. That's a fair old innings, but he wasn't really much of a hard-living type, What you know, didn't exactly get on the booze or the smokes or anything like that. It was pretty straight-laced. And from what I have been told, loved a fiery sermon in his parish as well. Mary's parents, Robert Wally and Joan Inglis, married in Lancashire in 1850 before emigrating to Australia two years later. Robert's family were natives of Blackburn, and at some point we're in Preston as well, which is not too far away from Blackburn. While Joan was from the Scottish town of Hoyke in Roxburghshire. Remember when I said I originally thought their families were somewhat boring? Well, 
both Robert and Joan's fathers were weavers by occupation and lived what seemed on the surface to be pretty normal lives. While that may be true for Robert's father, Joseph, the same can't be said for Joan's father, John, who on the surface seemingly went about an uneventful existence. Basic genealogical research showed that he was born and eventually died in the same town, as well as showing up on census records in, would you believe it, the same town. I'm sure you'd all forgive me for thinking, well, that solves that, but it doesn't. Before going into what I ultimately concluded, I must make reference to Joan's mother, who definitely wasn't who she was said to be for more than a century or however long it's been since then to now. According to various recorded registries, including Joan's death certificate, her mother was generally accepted as being named Mary. Pretty common in those days, I know. Over many discussions with some relatives who were stuck on the same point of confusion, we were still by no means certain that we had the right Mary. Some believed that she was Mary Murray, born 1795 in Cavers, Roxburghshire, only a few miles from Hoyk. This agrees with Joan's death certificate, which clearly gives her mother's maiden name or full name as Mary Murray of Roxburgh. As you all know, information on death certificates is only as good as the informant giving it. Therefore, I believe, contrary to many other opinions, she was not Joan's mother and the informant just didn't know any better. Now, that's a very feasible story on both sides of the coin. I mean, someone close to Joan said it was Mary Murray, so who am I to think otherwise? However, the informant only knows what they know, which may very well be a blend of snippets they'd pieced together over time or just something they thought they knew but weren't sure. But then they had to give some sort of information so that the registrar could fill everything out. There is, though, and this kind of backs me up a little bit here, no marriage record for John and Mary Murray at all, nor is there anything in writing linking them until Joan died in 1879 at the age of 49. On top of that, I have two other spanners in the works that potentially put the Mary Murray theory to rest. Firstly, further research unveiled John's mother, Joan's grandmother, to be Matilda, also known as Martha, or Mary, Murray. John's father's name was also John, so could this John and Matilda, Martha, Mary be Joan's actual parents, and she was simply raised by her much older brother. Both John and Matilda died while Joan was an infant, so there's potential for this theory. That said, though, they would have been in their 60s when Joan was born, in a time when 50 was considered to be the equivalent of, say, 80 in modern times. So I think it's safe to say this is thoroughly debunked. Secondly, to the Mary Murray theory and backing up the lack of a birth registry for Joan, is that John was not even in Scotland at the time of her birth. He joined the British Army in 1821 and was discharged 15 years later. During his time with the Scots Fusilier Regiment of Guards, he had deployments in Dublin, Ireland from 1824 to 1826, and then in Portugal for the rest of that decade during the War of Succession. More on the Portugal deployments soon. Another theory was that Mary Bleakey, sometimes written as Blakey, born 1800 in Wilton, Roxburghshire, was the right Mary. And there's plenty of circumstantial evidence to suggest why people thought this way. Mary Bleakey married John Inglis in 1838 and took on the role as Joan's mother from that point on. Where I draw the line on this Mary being Joan's mother is the large seven to eight year gap from the time Joan was born to the time John and Mary were married. My investigative intuition told me that Mary Bleakey most definitely was not Joan's natural mother. And after the addition of DNA testing in recent years, I found absolutely no connection, as I expected, to the uh, Bleakey family. She categorically appeared from all available as 
evidence to have raised Jonah's her own. And nearly 200 years later, I do thank her for it. Now, what DNA testing did tell me was there is a portion of Iberian ethnicity connected to me at a percentage high enough to be at fourth great-grandparent level. Every other ancestor of that generation is accounted for in where they came from and who they belong to. However, that Iberian connection seemed to attach itself to relatives in the English branch. The plot thickens, right? So just a bit of background. The Iberian Peninsula is in the southwest of the European continent, formed by Spain, Portugal, Andorra, Gibraltar, and a small part of France. John Inglis is my fourth great-grandfather, and as we already know, he was in Portugal on the Iberian Peninsula at the time Joan was born. My final theory thus leads me to believe that Joan's mother is a Portuguese woman who either died before John returned home or she went with him and died in Scotland. Can't find anything to verify either of those. This could explain why I can't find a birth record for Joan as well. Although, as a relative mentioned to me during our research process, perhaps they were covenanters. Now keep that word in mind as it will resurface during this episode. Covenanters were members of a 17th century Scottish religious and political movement who supported a Presbyterian Church of Scotland and the primacy of its leaders in religious affairs. The name is derived from a biblical term for a bond or agreement with God. At various crises during the 17th century, they subscribed to bonds or covenants in which they pledged to maintain their chosen forms of church government and worship rather than the accepted norm, which basically would lead to them not wanting to go down to the local government or royal chosen church and write down a bit of information with the, with the minister there. They just would have done it in their own place and in their own way with their own people. Ultimately, though, the Iberian theory is not something that can be proven 100%, and neither can any of the other theories. But the Iberian does trace to that generation and it had to come from someone and it can't find any reason that it comes from anyone else. So maybe I need to invest in a DeLorean and travel back to 1830 and see what I can find out. So back to Joan and her maternal ancestry aside and even further back to her dad, her death certificate gives his occupation as shopkeeper whereas the 1841 and 1851 Scottish census records give his occupation as a woolen framework knitter. Now, I don't have any information that might support or contradict the shopkeeper occupation. I can't find any shopkeeper, John Inglis, in any census, either in England or Scotland. Um, haven't looked in Wales or Rowan, but don't know any information that he might have been in either of those places anyway. John may possibly have been a shopkeeper at the time Joan died or at last contact, letter writing, so forth. Maybe it was a miscommunication by the informant. Robert Wally would have had a strong Northern English accent as would I suspect his adult children. Also, the word shop meant different things in the 19th century to what it does now. So maybe it referred to a workshop or maybe he had a shop where he sold the things he'd woven. Again, the DeLorean would come in handy right now. Before I move on from Joan, a question asked of me by a cousin is, why was she in England to marry Robert Wally there? Why didn't they marry in Hoyk? As you would normally expect of the time, like marriages generally took place in the bride's hometown, uh, some sort of a tradition that doesn't seem to continue on these days. Um, my initial thoughts were that Robert and his father worked in the weaving knitting industry as practically all Lancastrians did in those days, and perhaps 
Joan had been there for work or even her father had been there for work as well and that's how they came across the Wallies. Now, obviously, with a name like Inglis, they had to have come from England at some point and maybe they had a connection somewhere along the line going back many generations. So that could be something to look into. John Inglis also may have been in Manchester between Dublin and Portugal as the Scots guards were sent in to assist in mopping up during a period of troubles. Manchester was part of Lancashire back then and it's only 25 miles from Blackburn. On the topic of Robert Woolley, after settling in Australia, he was a competent businessman, a member of the Creswick Stock Exchange. Creswick's a pretty small place now, but back then it was pretty big. A lot of mining money, a lot of mining work. Um, so, yeah, that wasn't a small thing to be on the stock exchange there. And he was the director of several mining companies as well is not not a bad little um, climb up the ladder from where he came from. On several records, he's listed simply as a gentleman, a term used in the 19th century to indicate a man of means whose land or business holdings or investments provide a sufficient income to eliminate the need for additional employment or earnings. So basically, he was rich. And that's great. I'm glad he was. The conversations between myself and a descendant of John Inglis's son, also called John a few years ago, I was able to learn more than I'd previously known. John Jr., or shall I call him John the Third, was Joan's half-brother. Now, my relative told me of a letter written by him and his wife, Helen, to my second great-grandmother, Mary Wally, where he does refer to Joan as a sister, which is confirmed by research. This particular John, from all reports, was quite well known as a poet. I don't know the extent of his popularity. However, I do have a copy of one of the poems he's believed to have written for Joan at some point. It was first published in 1879 in a book titled The Borderland and Other Poems. And there was a reprint in 1912 as well. So I'm going to read it out for you now, so don't hate me if, if I struggle with some of the oldie-timey language. And it's called To a Flower from the Antipodes. I sigh as I see thee, thou beautiful floweret, and think upon her who hath nursed thee in love. I know while she culled thee so modest and tender, a blessing she asked from her father above, to bind with thy petals all glowing with sweetness, to lighten the heart of cash loved one afar, they're not sure that word cash. True love cannot die, though its home may be distant. Oh, space cannot darken that bright beaming star. Rich blossoms may bloom in their gayest of grandeur, but dearer than thee never drank of the dew. Though fading thy beauty with care I fold thee, and call thee a token of love the most true. An emblem of beauty, of love, and of purity. Thou welcome thou art to my heart's deepest core. Though fain would I rest where thy sisters are blooming, and list to the voice so endearing of yore. Though far, far away where the sky is unclouded, where man makes the earth to unbosom its gold, may no cloud of sadness overshadow the gladness that beamed in her face in the dear old days of old. Oh, sweet be her dreams of the land of her fathers, and thought we can meet and be joyous and young, and stray where our light feet have wandered in childhood, and sit neath the tree where the sweet mavis sung. I hope I didn't mess it up. <laughs> it makes some sense that this was written for Joan with more analysis, picking up on particular language, pointing to John missing her and Joan missing her home in Scotland. Also, Australia and New Zealand were referred to as the Antipodes in those days. So the connection seems pretty clear. 
Now, from my understanding, John himself left Scotland as well, emigrating to Canada. That is something I'm planning on researching further when time allows. Joan Inglis' grandmother was Joanna Gladstones, who she was no doubt named after. Our clan Gladstones was an influential and somewhat noble family in the Hoyk area, with roots to Scottish military hierarchy for a number of generations. Now, remember when I told you to keep the word covenanters in store for later use? This is where it returns. A further five generations back from Joanna were two brothers, James and Francis, who were officers in the Covenanter forces during Scotland's Civil War. Francis is my direct ancestor, and at some point he was knighted. Sir Francis and Captain James were killed at the Battle of Aldarn in 1645, which took place during the Scottish Civil War and was part of the larger Wars of the Three Kingdoms. It was fought between the Covenanters led by Sir John Hurry and the Royalists commanded by James Graham, first Marquess of Montrose. The battle occurred near the village of Aldarn in northern Scotland. Montrose's Royalist forces consisted mainly of Highland clansmen, while the Covenanters were made up of a mixture of Scottish lowlanders and a small contingent of English parliamentarians. There was a hell of a lot of civil war happening in Scotland, England and Ireland and possibly Wales at the time. And various branches of my family all seem to have some sort of an involvement in it. I, on my dad's side, some of my ancestors were officers in Oliver Cromwell's army, but that's for another time. As previously mentioned, Sir Francis Gladstones and his brother James were killed either during the battle or possibly during the aftermath when Royalist troops committed war crimes against wounded and surrendering Covenanters. So there you have it. That's how I discovered that my so-called ordinary maternal English family branch turned out to be quite extraordinary. And there's more to come in future episodes with stories of a world-famous playwright and actor, two brothers who built a media empire of sorts, and young men lost in the fury of modern warfare and much, much more. <laughs>